Welcome to another edition of Razor's Edge for Rookies. In this chapter, we are going to cover understanding constituent records. Now, for those of you who have used Razor's Edge before or any other fundraising software, you probably know what I'm talking about when I say constituent. But for those of you who don't, you're probably thinking, well, what the heck is a constituent? Now, to clarify, uh, a constituent is a record, whether it's an individual or an organization in a database, but even those can be slightly deceptive descriptions. So Razor's Edge breaks down constituents in two types. The first being an individual. Now we would normally think that's just a person, John Doe. But where that's slightly deceptive is John Doe may be married, might have children. And in Razor's Edge, it's not necessarily a practice to take the spouse or children and make them separate records. And the reason we don't is because the bulk of fundraising for nonprofit groups is done through bulk mail. If we had a wife as a separate record or children as a separate record, what we often end up doing is sending multiple pieces of mail to the same household. So a more efficient practice is to keep a family together as technically one individual record. So you would have a person who is the primary record and then you would have a spouse record and then relationships of that person as well. So keep that in mind as we continue and you'll understand as we get into the individual workings of a record. but. The first type is an individual, which doesn't necessarily mean just one person. Okay, now the second type, obviously, if the first was an individual, the second is an organization. Now, an organization can want a little bit more of a complex description. We start with things like, you know, a mega retail outlet or department store, Sears, Macy's, Walmart, that kind of thing. Uh, what also constitutes a an organization would be a government body. It could be a state or federal government office, DMV, whatever it might be, that's an organization as well. Uh, any kind of restaurant or cafe would be an organization. My coolest, coolest retail store example ever, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Manhattan and saw the ultimate Apple store. Looks like a cube, I swear it feels like it's something from the future. One of the coolest places. Um, that is also an example of an organization. Uh, so be, or so would schools and universities. Uh, that too is an organization, as is nonprofit groups, organizations like who you work for. All right. Um, now, with that in mind, let's move on to something that's very vital. Let's talk about the importance of searching for an organization or a person correctly. Now, what I'm touching on is probably the largest problem that databases have in any nonprofit group. Now, I've been a consultant for over a decade, and in my experience, I've never come across an organization that did not have trouble with duplicate records. And every duplicate that is ever put into a database is put there because of one common error. And what I'm gonna do is teach you how not to make that error. Now, let me explain why this is so important. Uh, we start with a thing like putting in individual records. And if we have a practice where we are accidentally putting in duplicate records, what we do is we start to magnify a problem. Now I've put together a couple picture slides here to give you sort of a visual of what that policy of adding duplicate records can do to a database and to an organization. Now, many of you seen a movie like Apollo 13 where we have the earth, and we have the moon and we have a goal. We want to send a rocket to the moon. So we start off with our place where we start and we have our goal of where we'd like to accomplish. And then what do we have? A trajectory of how to get there. Now, if you in your organization have somebody that's accidentally or creating duplicate records during a day-to-day -day business practice, what you'll find is that you have a slight error. Little problems start to arise. And what seems like a little problem now over time will begin to magnify and compound on itself to become something really monumental. Now, why am I making such a big deal out of duplicate records? I have had cases where I've been called in to clean up duplicate records where I've seen as many as four or five of the same person with the same address as five different records. Now, on the surface, it doesn't seem like a big issue, but when you are sending bulk mail and you're sending thousands and thousands of pieces of mail, out to constituents to try to raise money, and you find yourself sending four or five pieces to the same household, you're wasting a lot of money for something that you shouldn't. Now with the average cost of a single piece of mail being around 50 cents, you can see how this becomes a huge expense, especially if you have 500, 1,000, or even many thousand duplicate records. 
and compound on top of this in the event somebody moves and you're paying for address return service. So if you accidentally are sending four pieces of mail to somebody's household and they moved, you're now getting four responses back. That one piece of mail might just cost you $10 for that one household. You can see how this can get really astronomical in its expenses. So it's very vital that you learn how to properly search for a constituent record before adding a new one. Okay, so we're gonna move on now. Now, how do you open a record? In the Razor's Edge, there are actually two ways to do so. And the first is found right on your homepage. Typically, when you log into the Razor's Edge, this is the first screen you will see. For this example, I'm gonna show you what my homepage looks like. So this is my homepage. This is what I see when I log in right off the bat. And on the top, you'll have a section called Favorites. Uh, underneath would be a section called Action Reminders. Now, if you're active and using the Razor's Edge, that action reminder screen down below that panel should be filled with a bunch of things that you're supposed to do with various constituents. And we'll get into that as we get into much greater detail under the records. But what I want to bring your attention to is this top window. You'll see a thing called Quick Find Constituent. Now, what this is, is basically a, a very brief search window. So instead of having to go hunt in the records module and pick constituents and then uh, find a record that way, you can start right here. So the search window is basically a way that you can ask the database to return any records that meet a criteria. So for instance, let's say I'm looking for anyone with the last name of Smith and the first name John. Now I can come in here and type Smith just like that, but what's a lot easier way to do is just leave it broad. And this is a way that you find duplicate records and prevent yourself from adding dupes. And what I mean by that is, let's, let's use a simple example. Let's say I'm looking for someone with the name John Smithsonian. Now, I could come in here and think I'm typing the name right. Is that how I spell it? S-M-I-T-H-S-O-N-I-A-N-E-N-U-N. You see what I'm doing? And so as I do these searches, what I can do is when I look for it, it will come back with no record meets the criteria. So the way to prevent yourself from making mistakes of adding duplicate records is you leave your search very broad. So I'm going to do very broad. I'm going to say last name starts with S. And if I just leave that criteria, you'll see that I get an entire list of everybody, whether it's an organization or an individual that starts with S. So you can see how I can scroll up and down this list. Now, if I wanted to expand on that, let's say I wanted the first name starting with J, I can just type in a comma and a J. What this is asking is look for anybody with the last name starting with S and the first name starting with J. Now watch what happens. It narrows the field. Now I have Joseph Sinclair and John Smith. So my goal is to make sure I search and find anybody and have that list pop up that I can then pick. What will this allow me to do is, first of all, identify if there's a duplicate record. There would be two John Smiths. <clears throat> One thing I want to bring your attention to is these checkboxes on the bottom of a search window. Follow along down here. You'll notice that it has a checkbox that says display inactive constituents, display deceased, and all these. These by default should be checked. Why they're not or why they're not a default setting in Blackboard baffles me. Because obviously if a person is deceased, you want to know they're in there. If a person has is the spouse of a record, you want to know. These are all mechanisms to help you catch that duplicate record. And this is also another reason why some people end up adding dupes. Especially like for instance, if it's a deceased person. If the person is marked deceased and they are not even showing up on the search results, what ends up happening? You add another record and lo and behold, you added a dead record. So when you have a search window open, go check these boxes down here. Every box should be checked except for this one here, exact match only. And the reason being is you want every possible return to come back from a search. And when you do, notice what happens. I'm getting all these other people. I'm getting Joseph Sinclair as the spouse of Anne Sinclair. I'm getting Jacob Swift, someone else with a first name starting with J and a last name starting with S. So make sure all those boxes are checked to guarantee that you get your right result back. Okay, that's option number one. So, looking at option number two, the second way to open it is actually in what's called the records module. Now this is just a longer way to get to the exact same search screen that I did. Let me show you what that looks like. On the left hand side, you'll notice the modules section. What we would do is go to records and we would choose constituents. Now, you'll notice over on the right hand side, it has an open constituent window and it also has the quick find window. 
that quick find window is the exact same window that you just saw on your homepage. So I could do exactly what I did here. I can say S comma J and you'll notice I get the same results. Or if I choose to open a constituent with this button, I get that search window that you have remembered. Now the good part is after you filled in these check boxes down below, they will remain. It sort of remembers the last thing that you've done. So you don't have to put in those check boxes every time. <clears throat> when you come to this portion, now this is a helpful feature. You might have a situation where you don't even know who a person is. A lot of times in nonprofit organizations, when you get a check, you might have a last name and an address line. So in our case, let's say we had that John Smith character and we only had the last name Smith, maybe one of the wife or a wife actually sent in the check. Statistically speaking, most checks are signed by the spouse. So what you might find is a last name starting with Smith and the first and the address on the check might be something like this, 6211. And so what we'll do is do a search by address lines. And so this will help you identify the right record. That's another nifty trick about doing a very thorough search to make sure you have the right record. All right, take a pause over here. And what we're gonna do next is open up an individual and an organization record and compare them tab by tab. So you get a full overview of exactly what's included. Okay, so let's pick up right where we left off and let us go in and compare an individual versus an organization record. Now the way we're going to do this is we're going to go into Razor's Edge and we're going to open up two records. Let, let me show you how to do this. Alright, so from my Razor's Edge window, I'm going to go to records and I'm going to go pick two records. Now for the sample database, what I'm going to use is pick uh, our John Smith character. Now, one of the things I want to bring your attention to is whenever you've opened a record, you can see it as part of the recently accessed records, sort of like a Microsoft Word document, how sometimes uh, in the file dropdown window, you can see all the last letters that you've opened up in the same way you can see all the last constituents you've opened up. So what I'm going to do is we'll choose John Smith, the character that we opened up, and I'm going to minimize his record. And now I'm also going to go open an organization. Now one of the organizations in the sample database is called the Baldwin Entertainment Group. So I will come over here and type BALD and when I press enter it will find the Baldwin Entertainment Group because there's only one organization that starts like that. And then what I want to do is I want to put both of these records up and let's take a look at them sort of side by side before we start going into the tabs. One of the first things I want to bring your attention to is Whenever you look at the tabs across a record, in, in the case we're going to be going through, you'll see bio1, org1, bio2, org2, addresses. The only real difference between an organization and an individual record is this one here that you see. It's called the addressee and salutations. Now we'll get into all these fields and what they mean. But the first thing I want to bring your attention to are these sections wherever you see a red check mark. Now notice on John Smith, when I look at the bio one tab, there's a check mark. The bio two has a check mark, et cetera, et cetera. As I scroll through this, if there's a tab that does not have a check mark, it means that there's no data on that tab. So with one look, I can look at John Smith's record and I could see, well, there's a check mark on gifts. They have a gift. And the same thing with an organization. It's the same across. Wherever there's a check mark, it usually signifies that there's data underneath even when it comes to things like buttons. And we'll get into what these are, but take a look at where it says Baldwin Entertainment Corporation. You'll see a check mark next to the button that says aliases. It means that they actually have an alias on the record. On an individual record, down on the bottom here, you'll see three buttons. One says education, business, and bank. Now, wherever there's a check mark, it means that there's data there. Something is on that record. So with that said, let's take a look at the very tab that we're going to be covering today it is the bio one and the org one tab that are found on an individual and an organization record. 
So looking at our two records, uh, let's take a look at the data that's kept here. Starting with the individual record, we look at John Smith. Uh, the first things that come to mind is we have typical name fields. We have last name, middle name, first name. We also have titles, Mr. Junior. One of the things to keep in mind, you can have multiple titles or multiple suffixes on a record. And why this comes into play, for instance, let's say you had maybe a judge or a congressman. Your first title might be the Honorable John Doe, and then the second title might be Senator or Congressman. Now typically what this is referring to, and I'm going to bring your attention to it, is when you go to an addressee and salutation, the addressee and salutations are fields that are drawing off of the bio one tab. So to make it clear, when you do a drop down window, you'll see pretty much every combination of a person's name. Address C is basically how you address the outside of an envelope and the salutation would be how you start a letter. So for instance, the outside might say Mr. John Doe with his address and on the inside it would say dear, whatever the primary salutation is, dear Mr. Smith, dear Mr. Doe, whatever it might be. Now in the event that you had a field missing, so for instance, Let's go back to that title section. If I took away Mr. and I went to the salutation, notice that the Mr. is missing from the salutation. So again, this is drawing off of the fields of the bio one. This is a common mistake when people are saying, well, how come my salutations come out wrong when I do a mailing? I'm not getting the Mr. or Mrs. or the doctor. It's because a lot of times that the actual prefix or the title itself is not present on the record. So we'll go ahead and put Mr. One thing to bring your attention to is on the suffix. Now, this is a real common mistake I see in people who use the razor's edge. They will put in a record and they'll say, well, I'm gonna put in uh, junior as a suffix. And then what happens is when they try to leave that field, they get this, notice this warning that pops up. Do you want to add junior to the suffix table? Now, a common mistake is to think, yes, I'm going to go hit yes, and now I'm going to add junior to my list of potential records or my, my table list. But in reality, Razor's Edge has this, what I call it a flaw. Um, in a suffix, <clears throat> the proper format is to start with a comma. So it should be comma JR. And if you look at the options in the drop down window that in the sample database, it's nice and perfect. It's all comma JR, comma SR for senior, comma the second, comma the third, whatever it might be, <clears throat> instead of just putting it in. Now, keep that in mind because suffixes always start with a comma. And so you will find yourself commonly stuck with multiple versions of one suffix. One thing to bring your attention to as well, whenever you are in one of these drop down windows, these are things called tables. Basically tables are lists of predetermined responses. So for instance, I only want to use one of these tables. Uh, I don't want to have to come in there and type in Mr. every time. I don't want to type in Junior. I want to select from a predetermined list. Now this list can be accessed uh, at any time by hitting F7. Notice on the very bottom left of the record, and this is something you should get in the habit of doing, pretty much every field you ever put your cursor in, a cheat or a hint for that field will be in the bottom left. In this case, you'll notice F7 is the cheat. So when you type and you come in there and you say, well, show me what F7 looks like, um, your table will pop up. So take a look. This is what F7 will bring up, and you'll notice that there's a list of all the potential fields that can be filled in here. Now, if you have the security rights, and again, this is set up way in advance of you using the software, you can actually add, edit, or delete these. I would highly suggest you don't delete any table in here due to the fact that it might be present on a lot of other records. In the event that you delete a field that is present on some other record, they all will be gone. So if I deleted, for instance, Mr. Uh, everyone who had Mr. as a title would be gone. So I'll get into cleaning up tables in that at a much later time, but let's just focus right now on what a table is. A table is a predetermined list that you can select from so you don't have to always have the, uh, the field to be typed in. Okay, so continuing, let's just continue down. We have titles, we have suffix, we have nicknames. <clears throat> now an alias can be put as a nickname, a maiden name, or right here. So if I clicked the alias button, you'll notice that it pops open 
the option for me to add aliases. So if he had something other than his nickname, maybe he goes by John Boy. I'm just going to make one up here. What I can do is pick the type of alias from this drop down window and we'll make it another nickname. And when I say OK, you'll see that there's a small checkbox right here on the aliases. Now the aliases become handy, especially when it comes to companies or people with names that are difficult to spell because you can put in any potential way that you think someone might try to spell that name. And what that will do is bring that person back on a search result screen if they typed in, like for instance, if I was looking for somebody with the name John Boy and I type first name as John Boy, his record will now show up. So I have that much more opportunity to capture and find his record before going in and creating a duplicate record. Remember, the duplicates are the, the most prevalent error that you'll find in most databases, and this is one good way to combat that during the day. All right, let's continue. Um, we're going to scroll down and look at these other fields. This field you see ID. Now this is technically what's called a constituent ID. As a record is made, the razor's edge will give that record the next sequential number. So if he was the last record in the database, and I put in a new record, you'll see number 72, number 73, number 74, et cetera, et cetera. Don't get in the habit of trying to make this your own. Let the system create a number here. Don't try to toy with it. Don't try to come up with some fancy numbering system. I've seen people try to do that, and it usually ends in some sort of catastrophe. So just let the system do it. And one of the handy reasons is when it comes to removing duplicate records, that constituent ID becomes a quick way to identify which was the earlier record and which was the later record, just by which is the lower or the higher number, okay? All right, moving on, you'll see fields that are pretty self-explanatory, gender, social security number. Now, a lot of organizations don't keep this. Uh, birth date. Now, notice when I put my cursor in a date field. Uh, on the bottom, it gives me a couple different sheets. I can use F3 for today's date or F7 to pull up a calendar. And these become handy down the road. Just remember those. Whenever you're in a field, just keep it in the back of your mind. Look down to the left and you're going to see a cheat for what you can do there. Okay? The cheat is always relational to the field you're in. So for instance, I type deceased and I put my cursor in the date. There I see today's date, calendar date. <clears throat> this is a good time to bring up what's called fuzzy logic. A lot of times when a person is found out to be deceased, you don't know the actual date of the death. So you have the ability of putting in partial dates here. So for instance, in the event a person is deceased and you wanted to go in and put in a partial date, you can actually just put the year. So let's say we knew he died in 2009. I don't have to have a full date. So that's called fuzzy logic. And that also works with an age. Now for instance, let's say I I want to keep track of people's age. Now by default, when you put in someone's birthday, it will calculate their age for you. Notice here, I have a birthday of February 6, 1953, and it automatically calculates the age to the right. But if I didn't physically know his full-on birthday, but I knew the year he was born, I could type in a partial year. I can fill that in, and it will guess the year. It will take a, an estimated guess, and what that does is allows you to do queries and searches for groups of age groups. So I can still do show me anybody 55 and older and he'll show up on the list, even though I don't technically have his birthday. Okay, so I'm going to go back and put in his birthday. Doesn't matter really, this is just a sample database. And then let's move on. Uh, marital status, again, this is a table where you can divorce, married, partner, separate, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm not going to cover this button here, spouse. We're going to cover that in a little bit. Spouse, this one here called education, business, and bank, all are really relationships on the record. And we're going to get into those four buttons when we get to this tab over here, which is called relationships. Really what those buttons are are shortcuts to specific relationships. Because a person usually only has one spouse, that button is a shortcut to the spouse. Down here, the education, that would be a shortcut to their primary school or whatever you declare their primary school to be. This business is the place that they work. Again, it's a relationship to this record. It's usually another record that they're linked to. So, you know, in this case, John Smith is linked to a business where he's listed as an employee. All right. And the same thing with a bank. And really, this bank button, I think, is a throwback due to the fact that 
the original Razor's Edge was built off a platform of an accounting platform. And uh, they have a lot of this accounting stuff that sort of held over, you know, sort of, uh, I guess in the days when you're trying to do fundraising, you can always say, hey, we went to school together. And maybe, maybe in the old days, you could say, hey, we banked together. But nowadays, that's sort of a moot point. So, all right, let's move on. You'll see this section called the solicit code. Now, a solicit code is a very specific set of fields, and I'm gonna open this up so you can see what it is. What this is, is restrictions on how you solicit the person. So, a lot of times someone might come and say, hey, take me off your list altogether. I don't want any mail from you whatsoever. So in that case, you would select do not mail. But a lot of times, it's not so much an on and off switch. Sometimes people say, I don't want receipts or I don't want uh, direct mail solicitations, send me only newsletters. You know, these kind of things are, they're not exactly on or off switches, they are restrictions to what you can do with that constituent. So this is how you would basically tag them with what they have implied to you or told you how they want to be solicited. So if they said, don't phone me at work, you see how I can pull as many of these over as I, lo as, as I choose. Whenever you have one of these screens open too, let me bring your attention to these little arrows. You'll notice that there's, it looks like a play, fast forward, rewind, and then fast rewind, I guess would be the appropriate term. If you want to move everything to the right, you do the double arrow. If you want to move everything to the left, you do the double arrow left. If you want to move one at a time, you would just click one arrow and you'd highlight what you want to move back and forth. Pretty self-explanatory. Most people can figure this out on their own, but I'm bringing it up just because I want to be thorough. Now on the bottom left, you will see uh, some text on a record. What this is, is a snapshot into the bio2 tab. Now what this is showing is their constituent code. Now we will get into constituency codes when we get to the bio2 tab, but basically to show you, this is whatever code is on the bio2 tab. Now, a lot of times, You'll want to know what they are. Just by one look, as you get used to understanding constituency codes and how records are managed, you're going to want to know what they are all the time. So when you bring open a record, you'll have a peek at exactly what they are. All right, let's move over to the second side of the record. And this is where we keep track of things like an address. Now, whenever you have an address, it starts with the country on the top. And this is, again, a drop-down window. It's a table that you can set up. One of the beautiful things about Razor's Edge is you can actually set up the format for foreign mail. So if you're gonna be sending to other countries and they might list things slightly different than we do. Maybe they start with the country, maybe it starts with township or prefect, or maybe a region or state. You know, however they do their mail, you actually can go in and customize that country's mail. That's a little bit more advanced. We're not gonna get into that since it's quite uncommon, but I'm just bringing that to your attention. Now let's talk briefly about address lines. One of the things I see a lot of people doing, and it's, it's quite a mistake, is in the event that somebody can't get mail. This is so common in databases, it's almost hilarious, but you'll go in and you'll see this. No forwarding address. As if somehow that's gonna miraculously remove it from a mailing. When in reality, it doesn't do anything but print out a label saying no forwarding address on it. To keep track of a person who is lost mail or has no valid address, you never get rid of the actual address that's on a record. You leave it in place because you want to have a history of it. Let me show you a couple ways to address this. The first way is in this button called more. Whenever somebody is not to get mail or they just refuse to have mail, you can remove them like an on or off switch from receiving mail by clicking that more button. And you'll see this little checkbox here that says send mail to this address. By unchecking that, they will automatically be pulled out of any mail processing you do. Whenever you create a label, an envelope, or a letter, they will be pulled out. You won't even see their record. It's automatically, it's an on or off switch. If they receive mail, you check the box yes, and then what determines what mail they get would then be done by the solicit code. Maybe it's saying you send only certain solicitations. So you see the difference. One is an on off switch, and that's that yes or no send mail. And one is a sort of a gray area. They get some mail, they get all mail, or they get no mail. So <clears throat> that's sort of a way to keep the the process of actually picking who gets what mail out. Remember, on and off switch is in that more button, or picking what mailing they get is in the solicit code. That's all done here, right on the bio one tab. Now in the event a mail comes back and the address is incorrect or it's bad, 
you just, you don't make any changes to the address itself. You just come down to the bottom here, and I'm gonna show you these tabs in a, in a minute, but you would say has no valid address. By doing that, it's gonna remove the people from the mail run as well, but at least you have what you had as a history of the address. Now, in this case, I'm gonna uncheck that because we wanna keep this record active. One of the other things I wanna bring your attention to is address lines and the formatting of this. Now, this has been a very common question I get asked is how do you format addresses? Just remember that the post office loves brevity. The one thing they don't wanna see is something like this. They don't wanna see you spelling out boulevard. They don't wanna see you spelling out apartment. You know, when you do this kind of stuff, it potentially goes outside of the printable area of mailing. Now, it might not on this particular example, but what happens is if you've got somebody who has a very long street name and you do the word boulevard, followed by apartment, whatever it might be, a lot of times you'll go wider than the label that is being printed or you'll go wider than the what's called the automation square for most mailings. Now, if you're sending bulk mail like most organizations, you do not want to go outside of this automation square. The automation square allows your mail to be eligible for the lowest bulk rate. And the second you start getting pieces of mail that don't qualify, and if you get a, a certain percentage of them, you actually get fined from the post office because your mail is not able to be scanned by a machine. So remember, when it comes to actual addresses, you want to be brief. You don't want to type out road, you want to type RD period. You want to say street with ST. You want to be Boulevard, BLVD. You see what I mean? You don't want to spell it out. I know a lot of people have some sort of <coughs> policy in their head that, well, I want mine to look slightly different than the next. But that's not necessarily a good reason to go make it where you're going to pay more for postage on a lot of pieces of mail just because you want to have a prettier street name or the word. So just keep that in mind. Brevity is the best way. One other thing that you don't want to do is the address line itself, the address line one is supposed to be street number, street name, street court, and you can do apartment number or just something simply like this, number three, number 21. You don't have to type out apartment, suite, whatever it is. The other thing you want to keep in mind is you never use the first line to put a person's business. And I see this as a common mistake too. So let's say John Smith works at Starbucks. You don't wanna put Starbucks with the address below because if you ever send this file to an address correction, it will come back with the Starbucks being an error because that's not a valid address line. So the way this would properly be set up is John Smith would be a contact of Starbucks which has its own record and you're mailing to the contacts of organizations, not to John Smith in using an organization as line one. So just keep that in mind, something to keep in the back of your thoughts. Now you'll find if you're in a database that's been around for years or have had multiple people on it, you probably will run across that in the future. If you do, you wanna make sure that they're linked to the proper organization and the organization has the address. And this is just a, now a contact of the organization. We'll get into that in great detail as we continue especially when we get into the relationship tab and we start doing the exercises together.